it's a big ask to have people give up today's pleasure, all that yummy food, that sugar, that processed food that tastes so delicious for tomorrow's benefit. Hey everybody, Dr. Josh Axe here. Hey, welcome to my podcast. Hey, this week I have a guest I'm really excited to talk to. It's Dr. Terry Walls. And I can tell you, I've known Terry for many years now. She has an incredible story of how she overcame autoimmune disease. And we're gonna dig into how she did that today. Now, Terry is the a clinical professor of medicine at the University of Iowa, where she teaches internal mes- uh, medicine to residents and seeing patients who have had uh, traumatic brain injuries, and she's also conducting clinical trials. Um, she really focuses on a fun- functional medicine and a paleo diet, and she's authored many books of which I've checked out, including Minding My Mitochondria, How I Overcame Secondary uh, Progressive Multiple Sclerosis, and Got Out of My Wheelchair, which we'll talk about today. So Terry, hey, uh, welcome to the show. So excited to have you. Hey, thank you very much, Josh. All right, so let's dive in. Um, I got a lot of questions for you. Number one, I mean, I'd really love for you to share your story because the first time I heard your story, I was so inspired. And I know that there are so many people out there today who are struggling with autoimmune disease Mm -hmm. and they're looking for a natural way to get healthy. Share with us your story and how you naturally overcame uh, your autoimmune disease. So, you know, I'm a professor of medicine here at uh, the University of Iowa. And so when I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis in 2000, I sought out the best people I could find in the country, took the newest drugs, uh, but I went relentlessly downhill anyway. Uh, in uh, Two years into it, my physicians had told me about the work of Lauren Cardain. I read his books, his papers, uh, and decided to go back to eating meat. It was a big deal because I'd been a vegetarian, low fat for uh, many, many years. But I continued to go downhill. The next year I needed a tilt recline wheelchair. Uh, and then I started taking chemotherapy, continued to go downhill. Then I took uh, the new biologic drugs, uh, but continued to go downhill. It was switched to other uh, new experimental drugs. Uh, but that's what was very clear that the best drugs from the best people at the best centers were not stopping my march towards a bedridden, possibly demented, possibly intractable pain life. Uh, at that point, I started reading the basic science and experimenting based on what I uh, learned. I wrote my first book um, because I I figured out that mitochondria were key and I started using supplements to support my mitochondria and that slowed the speed of my decline. So I I was very grateful, Um, but I was still declining. By the summer of 07, I could not sit up anymore. I uh, struggled to walk 10 feet. I was having increasingly severe trigeminal neuralgia. Uh, but fortunately, I discovered the Institute for Functional Medicine. I took their course on neuroprotection. And I had a longer list of supplements. Uh, not a lot changed, but then I had a, a really big aha moment. What if I redesigned my paleo diet based on the supplements and nutrients that I saw basic science said were really important for my brain cells and my mitochondria? Uh, so I did that. And to my amazement, within three months, my pain was gone, my fatigue was gone, my brain fog uh, was gone, and I was beginning to walk again uh, with walking sticks and then without walking sticks. Six months into this, I was able to uh, get on my bike for the first time in uh, six years, and I biked around the block. Now, I'm crying, my uh, kids are crying, my wife's crying, and this really... Uh, uh, changes how I think about disease and health. Uh, In six more months, so a year into this, I'm able to do an 18.5 mile bike ride. And so this really changes uh, the way I think about disease and health, and it will change the way I practice medicine, and it will change uh, the uh, uh, focus of my research. Wow. Amazing. Amazing story. And one of the things I would, you know, follow-up question here is, what were the key parts of your diet and lifestyle that really helped you in overcoming this disease? And then also, Hey, how do you, you, did you use that same diet in your clinic today? Um, So what I think is pretty interesting, you know, I'm very, very fond of the paleo diet, but I I adopted the paleo diet going meticulously gluten-free, dairy-free, giving up all all grains, legumes, in 2002, but I continued to decline. So the paleo diet wasn't enough. 
I added supplements. I continued to decline, so they weren't enough. It was when I redesigned my paleo diet in a very specific way, chasing those nutrients. That's when the magic happened. Mm. I, and so I, I dialed back the meat. I ramped up the vegetables, more greens, more sulfur-contained vegetables in the cabbage, onion, mushroom family, uh, and more deeply pigmented stuff, beets, carrots, berries. Uh, and I um, added back organ meat. You know, I was uh, having liver uh, once a week. Uh, and that really was, bre it's breathtaking when I look back how rapidly those changes came. I mean, that's amazing. You know, one of the things, you know, when you look back and I, I've studied a lot of, you know, the traditional diets and traditional Chinese medicine and Ayurvedic medicine, and you look at things like glandulars and organ meats, how important those were to a part of a diet. In fact, if you go into yeah. like an ancient apothecary, it was full of, when they said medicine during those days, it was all herbs, mushrooms, and organ meats. It's like what people were buying yeah. and using. And so I love that you mentioned liver there. I mean, what a, what a powerhouse superfood of B vitamins and blood builder and you know, so all these aminos that help support liver detoxification, just fantastic. Absolutely. So, so share with me, what does this diet look like? And I'd love to hear, you know, what did, what did your meals look like? Like, what did you eat for breakfast, for lunch, for dinner? So um, I really ramped up uh, my greens. So I was having green smoothies in the morning, uh, and then I was having uh, leftover uh, meat from the night before. And I'd take another thermos of uh, green smoothie, uh, and I would uh, take some nuts with me for lunch. And then in the evening, I would have uh, uh, cooked greens, uh, some other vegetables such as uh, cauliflower, uh, uh, mushrooms, Rooms, uh, and then would have whatever meat we're having for that day. So, so I mean, your diet consisted of, I mean, it was a lot of greens, a lot of it was green a leafies, lot of greens. a lot of vegetables and, and meat. Correct, correct. So, um, you know, in the meat, it was about two palm-sized servings of meat uh, in the day. Um, I probably, and I had to, once I started eating the greens, I discovered I had this immense craving for greens. So I was probably having six cups of greens uh, really pretty consistently throughout the day. Uh, and what, the other thing that's interesting, Josh, is as I recovered and started traveling again, going to medical meetings, I discovered that if I couldn't eat the volume of greens that I was used to, in about 36 hours, my energy would begin to sink. I eventually learned that I had to travel with a head of cabbage so I could keep up my uh, a tremendous amount of vegetables I was consuming every day. You know, and, and uh, cabbage is really very nice in that it is uh, very happy in the refrigerator, not in the refrigerator. Uh, it travels well to your local uh, uh, hotel. I love that. That's great. I mean, it's so important too, because people would hear and talk about green leafy vegetables, but I still think that most people can't get enough. And this is the biggest part of your diet and healing from autoimmune disease. Share with me this. So obviously you ate really well. Did you continue to take some supplements? And if you did, have you noticed, did you notice any supplements that, hey, maybe it wasn't a game changer, but hey, I did notice that some of these specific supplements did make a difference. Well, it, you know, it'd be difficult to know. Uh, it, it, so it, uh, I'll back up. Uh, so I went paleo, not a lot changed, but I, I, I believed in the science. So I, based on my science, I, I decided that mitochondria were key. And so now I'm uh, looking after supplements to support my mitochondria. Things like uh, B vitamins, methyl B12, methylfolate, um, uh, lipoic acid, uh, carnitine, uh, creatine. I, and when I first started taking those, after about six months into it, I thought, oh, phooey, I'm just wasting my money. So I quit. And then I, I just, you know, 36 hours later, I discovered it's really hard to get out of bed. I was so uh, exhausted. Uh, and three days into this, my uh, spouse comes in and says, hey, honey, I think you ought to take your supplements again. Uh, and I took them. And then the next morning, I could get up and go to work again. So I thought, wow, that was really interesting. So two weeks later, I, I did the same kind of thing. I stopped uh, my supplements. And 36 hours later, I discovered that I was even more exhausted and had more difficulty getting up and walking. And so that got me much more fired up about reading uh, supplements uh, uh, and beginning to tell myself. So, so uh, clearly it was helpful with the fatigue. It was helpful with the energy. 
but it did reverse my illness. It really wasn't until I, I, I redesigned the diet. Uh, and, I used, and I still use the supplements because I think they were key nutrients. But by, by focusing on food, I was probably getting key compounds that were not part of, of the supplement because you know, food is, is much more complicated. You know, having uh, blueberries is, is much more than resveratrol. There are literally thousands of different compounds in those. So by stressing diversity, and doing the research to figure out where, what were the foods that were good sources of those key nutrients, I probably got thousands of other compounds that were very supportive for uh, rebuilding my brain. Wow. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think it's important to remember supplements are for supplementing your healthy diet, right? So yes. healthy diet's number one. But supplements can obviously you know, still make an impact, especially though when you're following that right diet. I think a lot of the nutrients you mentioned are you know, very similar to what you'd have in, in liver and compounding upon that. Yes. So I love that, like the liver, the green vegetables. So important. Just a quick question, just for everybody listening. What are some of those green vegetables? Are there one in particular or five? Like, like what are some of the ones that you try and get the most of? What I want people to do is have diversity because mm -hmm. the reality is every plant uh, literally is a mixture of a lot of compounds that are really great for you and a few things that are toxic. So as much as I love kale, if I had kale every day, those toxins would slowly accumulate. But if I have kale today, romaine lettuce tomorrow, a lot of parsley and cilantro the next day, uh, then chicory the next day, and then dandelion greens, and then mustard greens, and then come back over to the kale. Now I'm getting the diversity of all those carotenoids, all of that vitamin K, uh, all of that magnesium, and I'm dispersing the toxic compounds. Diversity, di diversity. You know, our, our ancestral uh, mothers and fathers uh, would have been having hundreds of different plant species over the year. Um, whereas if, if I uh, talk to the average uh, veteran that I was seeing in my VA clinic at the VA, they might have, you know, four or five vegetables are all that they're consuming in a day uh, or, or in a week. Uh, and, you know, I tell the goal is 200 different plant species in a year. Yeah, you know, and I, I think I think this is good to, as, as you're talking about living that hunter-gatherer lifestyle, different plants grow at different times of the year, right? That's the other thing. Absolutely. And, and, and that uh, uh, clan would have been migrating into different uh, uh, geographic areas. So they might have been in more marshy areas uh, and then in dry, drier areas. And things uh, would have had a uh, drier season. So yes, eat locally um, and eat according to the seasons. So good. Fantastic advice. All right. So you have a new book coming out and it's your revised Walls Protocol. By the way, if anybody hasn't checked out Terry's book, it's fantastic. It's called The Walls Protocol, spelled W A H. L.S. Walls Protocol. And this is her protocol that Terry, uh, Dr. Terry here has created that goes through her exact diet and regimen she followed in overcoming autoimmune disease. But there's a new revi revised version now. What were some of the revisions you made to, the, to, to, to your new release here, to, uh, Dr. Terry? Uh, so we have more uh, details on uh, the dietary plans. We talk about histamines, oxalates, uh, FODMAPs. And then I talk a lot more about ketosis. Ketosis um, and the research that has come out showing uh, the greater uh, levels of um, support for the benefits of ketosis for mental health issues, neurologic issues, uh, cancers, insulin resistance, hormonal balance. And I talk about the fact that we can get into ketosis through uh, many different ways. A high-fat diet using uh, coconut milk, uh, uh, MCT oil is one way. Olive oil is another way, but so is time-restricted feeding, so is periodic fasting. Uh, and so I, I talk more about ketosis and how to achieve that uh, depending on your clinical circumstances. You know, it, it, I'll tell you the other thing that uh, I spend a lot more time on is how to help people grow their internal motivation. Because it's, it's a big ask to have people give up today's pleasure, all that yummy food, that sugar, that processed food that tastes so delicious, for tomorrow's benefit. Um, so we, there's a, a big conversation about behavior change and how we can be much more successful. You know, I'd love for you to talk a little bit more about 
fasting and ketosis? Like what are the big benefits? And I know you're a researcher. You've spent a lot of time researching and reading. What are the real benefits? What happens in our body when our body goes into ketosis uh, and as well as when your body fasts? Well, uh, when we go into ketosis we uh, in our mitochondria, instead of burning sugar or glucose, we're burning ketone bodies or fat. Uh, and that fat turns out to be a super fuel for your brain. It will uh, stimulate the release of something called brain neurotrophic factors. Uh, and so these are sort of growth hormones for, your, for the brain messenger molecule for uh, repairing and uh, nurturing uh, the connections and the myelin in the brain. Uh, you'll also get some signals to uh, do more autophagy. Uh, that is sort of the recycled cell contents, uh, which can be very, very helpful if you have a chronic indolent infection such as Lyme's disease or Epstein-Barr virus. Uh, and it greatly improves your sensitivity to insulin. And if, if we look uh, across our society, we have more, many more children that are struggling with obesity, uh, metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, and now diabetes. And of course, a huge number of adults that also have insulin resistance, obesity, prediabetes, and overt diabetes. And so, so this improves our sensitivity to insulin and often can reverse uh, diabetes and get a uh, normal and appropriate uh, blood sugar in place. I love that. All right. So let's, let's talk about this. So, you know, when you have your patients come in and you work with patients, one, you talked about diet, you talked about some supplements and sometimes incorporating things like fasting and ketosis. What do you do from a lifestyle standpoint? That's one of the things you just mentioned, even about your new book is yeah, incorporating yeah. this sort of, and, and listen, today we know this, we're in a world today where media more than ever is driving fear, right? So there's all of like so many people are living in this fearful state and a lot of negative emotions, what yeah. are some of the things that you do in working with your patients on sort of, you know, I'm going to call it mindset medicine? Yeah, yeah, no. I, I think that's uh, very, very important. When we're in a fear state, um, we have higher uh, cortisol levels, stress hormones, higher epinephrine, norepinephrine, epinephrine levels. Those are adrenal hormones. And that shifts the chemistry of my cells away from repair and maintenance. Uh, it, it makes it more difficult to make hormones, more difficult to detoxify, more difficult to digest my food. I need to help people get out of that fear state. So uh, some strategies, uh, breathing meditations, um, uh, doing the four, seven, eight uh, breath pattern. So inhale to the count of four, hold to the count of seven, exhale slowly to the count of eight. Um, we can do diaphragmatic breathing. We can sing, hum. You know, uh, if people uh, have a religious community, I encourage them to go join the choir and be uh, part of a uh, singing uh, organization or a community uh, barbershop or to sing in the shower. Um, these are uh, wonderful things. Uh, a, a, a tradition that we've implemented here uh, during the uh, uh, concerns about the COVID pandemic uh, was to uh, go around the table and express gratitude for something that happened that day in our life. And it may be one thing or several things, but taking the time to express that gratitude also helps lower the cortisol, uh, lower the stress hormones, uh, and shift us more towards that uh, uh, vagal activated state. Well, I love that. Great, great advice. I love that. And, and the thing that I just want to point out too, you know, I think you know, if we're comparing what happens a lot of times in our conventional medical system, and then even sometimes our natural medicine system, the one thing that we are forgetting so many people to doctors today is the sort of mindset medicine that you're talking about. You know, when I look mm -hmm. at, which I've spent, you know, a lot of my career studying Chinese and Ayurvedic medicine, all of these ancient practitioners, they worked with their patients on lifestyle medicine, prescribing things like as you're saying, great deep breathing was huge in Ayurvedic medicine. As you're talking about these breathing patterns, Tai Chi, yoga, other other things, you know how emotions affect our health. So I love the gratitude practice and the advice there. Is so so good. Take us through, like, what does your typical day look like today for you caring for your own health? Like, I always love to ask practitioners that. Sure. So um, this will be sort of surprising. So I'll I'll uh, get up uh, early. 
Uh, and I will have a couple rounds of four, seven, eight, uh, a uh, gratitude visualization. Then I will get up and I will do my workout. Uh, and I will, may do a strength training workout um, or I'll get in the pool and swim. Uh, after that, I uh, have a sauna in my near infrared uh, sauna. I, at, from there, I go do a cold shower. I, and then I will I have some uh, green tea, detox tea, and launch into my day. Uh, then I will do my usual day. Uh, in the evening, uh, I will make supper. And that's the first time that I eat. Uh, so that's uh, about 5 o'clock. I'll make supper for the family. Uh, we'll do our gratitude practice. Uh, we'll clean up the meal. I, and then I'll have a... Uh, uh, I, I may do another very light workout or stretching, I, and then I will have a meditation before going to bed. Now, some some nights again, you know, it'll depend on uh, what's happening. I may do an ice bath uh, before. Um, and when I take the ice bath, because I'm, I'm chilling my core temperature just before going to bed, that is the uh, the most rapid way to fall asleep in a, the deepest, most restful sleep after doing an, uh, an ice bath. Wow, amazing. I love that. So that's that's about a two and a half to three hours of self-care that I've learned to get into my day. And of course, that took you know several years to evolve into how I manipulated my day to make all of that work. Yeah, I mean, you know, not a lot of people want to take a cold shower before bed. I think a lot of people take warm, hot things before bed rather than cold, but I love hearing that idea of getting really cool uh, before bed. And obviously, you know what, I think if, you know, for most people getting cool and then how, so a heavy blanket, this is one of the things I used to recommend my patients to get cool, but then put on that heavy blanket. A heavy blanket, yeah. You know, the occupational therapist will talk about uh, using a weighted blanket, mm -hmm. that that can activate your vagal nerve, uh, parasympathetic tone can be very, very calming. I love that. Are, you know, one of the things I think, well, I wanted to ask this because again, I know I have a lot of people who listen to my program, many who are radically healthy, but a lot who are struggling with health issues, quite a few who have autoimmune disease. What, what are some of the diseases and conditions that you have most seen that have really benefited from your WALS protocol? Well, uh, so the, in terms of groups, people have insulin sensitivity issues. So diabetes, prediabetes, metabolic syndrome, polycystic ovarian disease, they all do very, very well. Uh, people with autoimmunity, so you know, multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, systemic lupus, fibromyalgia, psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis, uh, they've done very, very well. Uh, it, and then in, in the VA, I saw folks with uh, post-traumatic um, uh, stress disorder, traumatic brain injury, uh, uh, chronic headaches, uh, some mood disorders, they've also have done uh, very, very well. One of the uh, things that my vets taught me was uh, really working with them at helping them understand why they want to go on this journey. Uh, because it is a big ask. You know, you and I ask our, our people to change their eating pattern uh, and to change their self-care routines. And that uh, is a big conversation to help them be inspired, to be curious, and, and to be willing to do this work. Oh, uh, Yeah. That's great advice. You know, as, as you're, as you're saying this too, just, Hey, everybody listening, just, you know, one of the things I love about Dr. Terry here is that she's lived it. She went from having a severe, severe autoimmune disease and overcoming it naturally with her own research and studying and trying things on herself, seeing, seeing, and seeing what's worked. And I think that's one of the most powerful things. Oftentimes there are people giving advice who maybe haven't experienced it for themselves. And there's something about when you when you're an overcomer, and you've done that yourself, I think that is just so, so powerful. So that's one of the things, Dr. Terry, I love about your protocol is these are things that worked for you. They've worked mm -hmm. for thousands of other people as they've implemented the WALS protocol. And anyways, I just wanted to say, so for everyone listening, I want to encourage you guys, grab Dr. Terry's book, go to amazon.com, go to barnesandnoble.com. Hey, you can run out to your local bookstore, but grab a hold of this book and then start implementing, especially those eating plans and the recipes and the things she's talking about is so important. And Dr. Terry, one of the things I've heard you mention quite often here so far is you've mentioned mitochondrial function. 
<laughs> what exactly are our, in the simplest terms you can, the, what, is my, what are our mito, mitochondria and what is getting those functioning more optimally? What is that going to do for our current health and our immune system and our longevity? Well, the mitochondria are um, the little power plants for the cells. Um, our cells, um, about a billion and a half years ago, we think the oxygen content of the atmosphere uh, elevated, uh, which led to a huge die-off of uh, uh, life. About 95% of life died. But because of the random mutations that occurred, we developed the sequence to do the Krebs cycle and utilize oxygen. And these ancient bacteria were then engulfed by bigger bacteria, and they are the forerunner of our mitochondria. Now, all of our cells depend on these ancient factories, these ancient bacteria, to generate energy. And the parts of my body that need the most energy, my brain, my eyes, my heart, have the most mitochondria per cell. And if your uh, organ is not working very well, a very common driver is that the mitochondria are strained, struggling to produce enough energy. So in my case, I had severe fatigue. I was having uh, severe pain. Uh, and so that led me down the path of thinking mitochondria were not working well. Uh, and this uh, path of creating supplements, the supplemental program to support my mitochondria. And then, of course, eventually designing a food plan to support uh, those mitochondria. Awesome. You know, one of the things is people are following your, your diet here or any diet that's very different than the sad diet, the standard American diet. You know, one of the things I think that's a challenge for some people, Dr. Terry, is getting their whole family on board. I know when I was running my full-time functional medicine practice, you know, I did that for five years and I took care of loads of families. One of the bigger challenges was, hey, you'd have you know, a husband or a wife or sometimes kids, and maybe one person would gravitate and be ready to change. Maybe everyone else wasn't, but I really found that when the entire family changed, the results were so much better. Absolutely. So what are some of the things you do in working with your patients and helping get the whole family on board? Uh, we have family appointments. So in the lifestyle clinic, we would have an appointment for the veteran and would ask them to bring their significant other. And occasionally they'd bring in uh, one child as well. Uh, and, and I would uh, go through the timeline, the matrix, explain why diet was so powerful and that uh, we're addicted to these um, sugar, uh, salt, inactivity. Uh, and if the food is in that person's environment, it will find their mouth and they will eat it. So we need to have their eating environment be clean, just like if I was helping them get past uh, tobacco or alcohol or marijuana or cocaine, we'd have to clean out their environment. Uh, and uh, so the people who were, would embrace that as a family uh, would be very successful. And I would acknowledge that it may be that only the family member has to be that pure on their diet. And so if you're not with your spouse for supper and you're out with your friends, that's fine. Eat what you want, but don't come home and say, I had pizza and beer like, oh my God, it was so wonderful. Yeah. So you don't taunt them with your dietary indiscretions, but when they're away from you, yes, they're, they're adults. They get to do what they want. We, we had this conversation a lot about uh, children who, ha who perhaps the child has the health issue and you're trying to get the uh, child on board and they do well. Then they enter um, middle school and now they're a little more pushback. Uh, so one of the strategies that my, my families uh, taught me was that they could tell their adolescent, uh, emerging adult children, if I'm paying for the food, it's going to be stuff that uh, is compliant with the dietary recommendations. If you want to buy something that's not compliant with that, you have to buy it and pay for it before when the meal is ordered. And you have to pay for it uh, when you make the order. Yeah. Uh, and so when, when families sort of realize that they can control what they provide their children, they can't force their kids to eat it or not, but they can control what was in their house, and then they control what they choose to pay for. And beyond that, they have to make the case to the child. Hmm. And uh, the child is going to obviously end up making their own decisions. Wow. You know, one of my last questions is, is sometimes when you eat the way that we, I know we both eat, 
sometimes the price can run, you know, the price tag, you know, they've called Whole Foods. We've all heard it called a whole paycheck. And we know that I, I've, I, again, in running my functional medicine clinic, you and I probably dealt with these the same way, but sometimes people would say, you know, this diet's more expensive. What do you say to that? And is oh, there a way yeah. in any strategy yeah. you have to make it more affordable for people? So at the VA, the uh, patients that I saw um, in the therapeutic lifestyle clinic were living on food stamps, yeah. on disability, very fixed income, uh, very limited resources. Um, so we would teach them how to make a menu, um, how to shop using ingredients uh, and cook using ingredients. We had cooking classes. And I, I'd have to teach them that all, everything that you put in your mouth beforehand, all of your fast food, your uh, uh, alcohol, uh, your tobacco, your uh, energy drinks, your fancy coffees, that's all part of the food budget. And so if we're going to go make a menu and go to the grocery store, your, your grocery bill will go up. Um, but we would help people understand that part of the food budget was probably less, particularly if they're cooking at home. And we had cooking classes. I did teach people how to have uh, vegetarian meals, uh, beans and rice, in a pressure cooker to make it more affordable for them, how to go to their local meat locker, because uh, many, at least in the Midwest, many towns have uh, uh, deer shooting uh, because of the oversupply uh, of deer in the area. So there's free venison for you. Uh, and, and my vets taught me that they could go to the farmer's market and go up to the vendors and say, now at the end of the market, what's the best price you'll give me if I take everything that's left? And so they can end up paying pennies on the dollar for organic produce. The, the real issue is teaching people how to cook at home uh, and uh, why the quality of the food matters. Yeah, it's great advice. You know, I, and I used to do a similar thing. We would teach shopping classes, budget classes, and really go through sort of the menu plan of hey, you can actually buy canned, wild canned salmon at Costco for, for a great price. Or as you're saying, use yeah. a pressure cooker, these things of beans, rice, venison, certain vegetables, cooking those together. I mean, if somebody really sticks to a diet of, you know, rice, beans, and then some really high quality meat and vegetables and some fruit, I mean, that's, a, that's an amazingly healthy diet. It can, it can be very diet. inexpensive. And, you know, here in Iowa, there is a... Um, a huge number of plants that are uh, edible, easy to identify, uh, and actually uh, very nourishing. So a lot of our invasive weeds, uh, for example, garlic mustards, actually is, is uh, an escaped uh, pot herb that's really quite delicious. So teaching people that this foraging is a fun family activity. Now, mind you, you have to get trained so you're identifying your food properly. But it, it certainly can be done. We had tremendous transformation of our patients and people were living on food stamps. Yeah, and I think, and this really comes back to one of the things that you talk about that I know you and I are both so passionate about and that's becoming educated. I mean, really yes. learning. And you know what? Like there's something to, the more that I read, the more that I want to take and consume what I'm reading about. If I'm reading about the benefits of watercress and, you know, broccoli, rabe, and some of these things that maybe people haven't heard of, but are fantastic foods. Like, I want to eat those things. When you're reading about turmeric, when you're reading about ginger and bone broth. And so I want to encourage everybody, uh, run out and grab Dr. Terry's book. It's called The Walls Protocol. And if you're watching here on video, you can see it right there. It is a radical new way to overcome autoimmune disease. You can go on Amazon.com right now, BarnesandNoble.com, run out to your local bookstore. But if you, and I also want you to think about, is there someone you love and you care about who is struggling with insulin issues like diabetes, autoimmune disease, migraine headaches, severe, you know, uh, you know, uh, food sensitivities, like these sort of issues, I want to encourage you, this is the perfect book for people to follow the advice that Dr. Terry is talking about. So run out, grab her book. I want to say, Dr. Terry, it was a joy and a pleasure. I love your passion. I love as well your practicality in teaching people. Um, so a, a lot Because I know you spend a lot of time researching a difficult topic, but you make it so accessible, easy to understand, and really teaching people how to actually, again, do things like eat healthy on a budget, follow the menu plan. It's just anyways, it's bravo. And thanks so much for coming on. Thank you, Josh.
All right. Hey, thanks everybody for listening to their podcast. We'll be next uh, back next week. And thanks again to Dr. Terry Walls. Uh, again, so excited to have her on the podcast today. Thanks everybody. This podcast is for information purposes only. Statements and views expressed in this podcast are not medical advice and have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. In some cases, individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest in products or services referred to herein.